Good afternoon. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for this webinar entitled Domestic Violence, Guns, and Children, Putting Policies into Action. Before we dive into today's topic, I'd like to address a few housekeeping items. Okay, so if you're having any technical difficulties, please reread your confirmation emails. The latest one was sent at 10 o'clock this morning. In the emails, you will find links to join the meeting and to download the WebEx event manager for first time users. You should hear the audio through your computer speakers and there is not a call in phone number for the audio. If you are not hearing any sound, we recommend that you disconnect and then rejoin the session. Make sure you select to join the audio conference when prompted. At this point, we will not be able to help you with technical issues. If you have any questions for the presenters as we go along, please type them into the chat box in the bottom of your screen and direct them to our host, Madeline Smith. There will be approximately 15 to 20 minutes of time designated for question and answer at the end of the presentation. Because of the large group, it is not possible to open up the lines for audio or verbal questions. Also, other participants will not be able to view the questions or comments that you submit. Due to unforeseen circumstances, uh, Christian Soltisiak from Ceasefire PA will not be presenting today. Instead, Rona Gerber from Ceasefire PA will present on Christian's behalf. We thank Christian for the content she contributed to this webinar. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted at chop.edu slash violence within the next week. If you are a social worker or a nurse, there is an opportunity to receive credit for this webinar. Additional information was provided in the reminder email sent from WebEx at 10 o'clock this morning. If you wish to obtain credits, please note, you must be logged in as an individual, not as a group for the full duration of the webinar to be eligible. You will also need to complete the online survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. Also, if you are a CHOP employee requesting nursing continuing education credits, please remember you will need to complete the post-webinar evaluation in my career to receive your certificate. Rona Gerber, Christian Soltisiak, Eileen Horgan, Joanne Wood, and I, Teresa Salinas, have the ability to control or influence the content of this educational activity and have completed and signed the CHOP Disclosure of Relevant Financial Relationships form, affirming that neither us nor our spouses or partners have had any, in, in the past 12 months, have had any relevant relationships with a commercial interest that could be perceived as a conflict of interest with this educational activity. If you have any questions or experience any difficulties in obtaining your continuing education, please send an email to Madeline Smith at smithm37 at email.chop.edu. This webinar is being hosted by the Violence Prevention Initiative at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. My name is Teresa Salinas. I'm a medical advocate at Lutheran Settlement House's Bilingual Domestic Violence Program and an Intimate Partner Violence Specialist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia's Violence Prevention Initiative, working within the STOP IPV program. Our goal today is to educate on the current policy landscape related to domestic violence and guns in the home, specifically focusing on Pennsylvania's Act 79 and empower you to support patient families who may be in crisis. Our specific learning objectives are to understand the mandates of PA Act 79 and where to find information and resources, explain intimate partner violence, the overlap between domestic violence and child abuse, and how this topic can be addressed in a healthcare setting, and identify the importance of understanding Act 79 to help protect families. So for today's participants, we had over 150 people registered for today's webinar, speaking to the interest and concern in addressing the issues of domestic violence and guns in order to protect children and families. 
Among participants, we see people from many disciplines, medicine, social work, advocacy, psychology, education, research, and mental health, as well as many locations. We have Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Virginia, Illinois, Wisconsin, Texas, and Colorado. Now it's time to introduce our speakers for today. Rona Gerber is the Director of Development at Ceasefire PA. Eileen Horgan is Supervising Criminal Advocacy Attorney at Women Against Abuse. Dr. Joanne Wood is an Attending Physician at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Research Director of Safe Place, Faculty Member at Policy Lab at CHOP, and Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine. So just to begin, I wanted to start with a basic definition of intimate partner violence. Um, so intimate partner violence is a pattern of behaviors that someone uses to gain or maintain power and control over a partner or ex-partner. Um, so that abuse can look like many different things and affect a lot of different domains of a survivor's life. Um, so the types of abuse that we're talking about goes beyond uh, physical violence but it includes physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional, mental, some people call it psychological abuse, as well as financial abuse and technological abuse. Um, and just a note on prevalence, um, this is definitely happening here in the United States. Um, the last very um, cohesive survey that was done showed that one in three women and one in four men will experience abuse from a partner in their lifetime. Um, so that, that is from a CDC survey. Um, another thing that we do know is that the way that government forms are set up, that we really only have information about partner abuse in that binary, and there's not a lot of information about people who are trans or gender nonconforming, um, who identify outside of that binary of women and men, but it is very prevalent regardless of gender and life experience. Um, and just a note on language throughout this presentation, we will be discussing intimate partner violence or IPV, domestic violence, DV. Um, it can also be called domestic abuse, relationship or partner abuse. So, you know, for the purposes of this, we're going to be talking about family violence as domestic violence and intimate partner violence as violence that's specific between two people in an intimate relationship. So with the themes that we're talking about in this webinar today, children, guns, domestic violence, we're really talking about a lot of overlapping issues. So what is at the intersection of these three things? A lot of times when we're talking about children and guns, the first thing that comes to mind is safety, right? So accidental injury or death um, as a result of access to a firearm or having a firearm in the home. And we know that that increases risk for that. When we're considering children and intimate partner violence or domestic violence, we often think about the effects on the child in terms of exposure to violence in the home, right? So those, those mental impacts, those physical impacts, those developmental impacts that might affect children, um, you know, especially later on in adulthood um, by witnessing this, this violence in the home. Um, and then also um, an area to consider is the overlap of domestic violence and guns. Um, it's pretty common uh, lethality assessment protocol that you know, when you're talking about domestic violence and any partner abuse that's happening, there is an increased risk um, of injury and lethality if there are weapons present. So there is a, a big overlap between domestic violence and guns as well. So if you look at the, the very middle of the Venn diagram here, we're really talking about physical safety and victimization um, when it comes to guns, children, and DV in the home. The good news is, is that there is um, a lot of opportunity for intervention at this intersection. So what we'll get a little bit more into uh, during today's webinar is how to address this. Um, so I have a list here of things that are possible interventions or things that address this risk. Screening, um, so screening for family violence, for abuse, 
or access um, to weapons or weapons in the home. The second intervention is safety planning, which I'll talk about in a few slides. Counseling, so for children and families who have been affected by these issues and have been traumatized by violence, having some sort of ongoing support for those effects, um, you know, post-violent post, um, incident. And then we're also talking about legal protections and policy that can be developed to try to address this problem or prevent um, these these things from happening in the first place, which is when we will get into Act 79 and what's happening uh, here in Pennsylvania. I have uh, two case examples provided. I'm going to read them out loud um, for accessibility, um, but they are also on your screen. Um, so here's this first case example. A mother brings her three children to clinic for routine care. When asked about safety in the home, she discloses that her partner has a gun and that there was a recent incident of domestic violence where police responded. She reports that since things have de-escalated, she did not seek a protection from abuse order because she wants her partner to have a place to live and the weapon is securely locked. She said she sometimes feels nervous about the gun in the home and that her partner has never hurt the children or used the gun in any threatening way. So with this case example, um, you know, this disclosure, you know, may have happened as a result of screening about, you know, violence in the home or counseling on having guns in the home. But ultimately, you get a nuanced uh, situation about, you know, trying to keep the, the family as safe as possible um, while, you know, understanding the nuances about how um, seeking police intervention or protection from abuse order might also affect the safety and um, the stability of the family. Second case example, um, a father brings his child with a minor sports injury to the emergency department. When screened for intimate partner violence, he discloses that his wife is verbally abusive to him and that he does not feel safe at home. He reports that she is very controlling, regularly threatening to leave with their children and sometimes to physically hurt or kill him. The family brought a gun into the home for protection a few years ago when there was a series of home burglaries in their neighborhood. So here you have a case of, um, you know, having a gun in the home for safety reasons, but actually having it be a, a potential for harm for both um, this father and his children. Um, even if there isn't a presence of physical intimate partner violence or abuse at home, um, definitely introducing the gun or the weapon into the home increased risk um, for harm. So when you're working with families and, you know, children, patients, um, whoever you work with in your population, uh, the major intervention here um, for these situations is, is safety planning. Um, if you're not familiar with safety planning, what is it? Um, it's, it's basically what it says, you know, it's, it's a plan to increase safety. Um, the basic tenets of it are that it is focused on the victim or survivor, um, and it's led by that person as well. So safety planning is not, um, let's get you into shelter, or you have to get a PFA, or, you know, do, do X, Y, and Z. This is what everyone has to do um, to get to a safer place. Um, it's really based on the individual and their individual circumstances and needs. And it also considers all dimensions of safety. And by that, I mean, not just physical safety, but emotional safety as well. Um, a lot of times, if there is past trauma, considering triggers for emotional or trauma responses is a really important thing, um, both in the home, in the community, in workspaces uh, or school, you know, wherever someone spends their time, understanding how to maintain physical and emotional safety for themselves um, is, is really key to this process. Uh, safety planning is sort of inherently um, solutions focused. So starting with the question, what has worked to keep you and your children safe, right? So what is someone already doing that is keeping them safer? Um, what has worked in the past and what hasn't worked and why didn't it work? Have things changed between now and, and then and now? 
Um, and then ultimately with the safety plan, you have to consider, you know, what the concrete op options are for someone. So it will ultimately result in an offer to connect folks to resources and ongoing support, um, both within and beyond the medical setting. So just tying it back into our case example with the father in the emergency department, knowing that you know you might not see that family or that patient for clinical care beyond the interaction that you're having, but how do you do your best to create a safety plan with them and to connect them to ongoing support that will impact their their life and their safety beyond that clinical interaction, you know, after discharge, right? So that's always, you know, it's solution oriented, it's future focused, and it's really aimed at increasing safety. Um, one thing that I always like to remind myself and medical providers and everyone doing this type of work with families is that unfortunately there's never a guarantee of safety, right? So while you can work to increase safety, um, you know, it's never guaranteed, right? So here we are um, at Act 79, the basics. Um, so I will now turn the mic over to Rona Gerber and Eileen Horgan to dive into more of the specifics of Act 79. Oh, sorry, my, my bad here. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll go over the basics now and then I'll, I'll introduce um, Rona and Eileen later. Um, so Act 79, basically the, the key facts are that it was signed into law by Governor Wolf on October 12th, 2018. So last fall, um, and it went to into effect in April of 2019, April 10th. Um, so this is something that is newly um, affected. Um, it amends the Protection from Abuse Act um, and amends the Uniform Firearms Act. Uh, and basically it's aimed to align the state law with the federal law. Um, so bringing the PA state law into alignment with the federal law that already exists. Um, so it's the first time in 14 years that the Pennsylvania legislature has addressed gun violence um, in this capacity. So when you're when you are safety planning with families, um, obviously this is a new element, right? This is a new law that is affecting um, people at the individual level and also creating change on systems level. So when you're safety planning and incorporating Act 79 into it, you're going to you know assess the risk. So ask about weapons in the home. Um, is there a weapon in the home? If not, does the person who is acting abusively have access to weapons? Have they ever used weapons before to threat or to harm? Um, and ask if someone knows about Act 79. You know, there's this new law in Pennsylvania. Um, are you aware of it? And this is, you know, the basics of what it what it means. Um, providing accessible information and discuss how the new law may affect their options. So if they are unaware of the law, they can't necessarily um, say what they need to say or do in, for instance, in the court process. Um, so having them be aware of it and feel empowered uh, with that knowledge is a, is a really key part of safety planning. Um, so you have to integrate that, right? Um, and just as a note, as I said before, it is definitely survivor focused and led and no one is ever required to file for a protection from abuse order um, or to report abuse to the police. Um, we do see that a lot of times when there is, um, you know, kind of ongoing um, physical intimate partner violence or if there is violence happening in the home, um, you know, other people become aware of it, right? So sometimes it's not always the victim or survivor's choice to report it to the police. However, um, you know, the police get called, right? So even when there is a response from law enforcement, um, always re emphasizing that, you know, it's part of someone's personal safety plan of how they want to report it, when they want to report it, um, if they want to get a protection from abuse order or not. Um, you know, I would say that if there is imminent risk for harm, most of us would be encouraging someone to report it and to get that uh, protection from abuse order um, and to kind of exercise as many rights as possible 
for protection through the legal system, um, which is where Act 79 comes in, in terms of um, firearm um, after protection from abuse order is in place. Um, so it might actually inform someone's decision about whether or not to get a protection from abuse order if this is something that they're considering doing. And just a note, um, I have a, a screen cap here from the Philadelphia Inquirer from last month just to talk about domestic violence and Act 79, sort of what's happening on the ground. Um, so I'm going to read the um, title here. It says, New PA law aimed to disarm accused domestic abusers within 24 hours. Hundreds in Philly haven't turned in their guns. Um, so obviously, there's a lot more information and detail in this article, um, but it does a good job of talking about the city of Philadelphia and really what's happening on the ground locally. Um, obviously, this is just one element of what's happening statewide as well as you know across the nation, um, but it really does a deep dive into um, what is happening in the city of Philadelphia now that this new law is enacted, um, you know, what's actually what's actually happening. Okay, so now I will turn the mic over uh, to Rona Gerber and Eileen Horgan to dive more into the specifics of Act 79. And uh, thank you to Christian Saltesiak to, from being a uh, content contributor for this portion as well. Thank you, Teresa. So in talking about the importance of Act 79, and the importance of getting guns out of the hands of domestic abusers. Um, it's clear that there's deadly consequences when there's firearms involved in domestic violence situations. So what this slide highlights is some information that's provided by the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Each year, PCADV completes a fatality report where they look at the domestic violence homicides um, across the state and review the homicides and the method um, of killing. And you can see that over the last decade, firearms have remained a top method for um, killing in domestic violence situations. So, as Teresa already mentioned, Act 79 really does two things. The first thing is that Act 79 amends the Protection from Abuse Act. Under the Protection from Abuse Act, if a temporary order includes uh, at attachment A, ordering a relinquishment of a weapon, or there's a final order that includes re weapon relinquishment, the weapon must be relinquished in, within 24 hours of service of that temporary order or the entry of the final order. One significant change regarding firearms under the Protection from Abuse Act is that you can no longer relinquish firearms to third party friends or fam family members. Previously, before Act 79, that was a possibility. You didn't have to relinquish to law enforcement. Um, you actually could relinquish to someone that you knew, um, including your family members. And there were instances where the family members the weapon to the person who had been ordered to relinquish the weapon. So now under Act 79, the list of um, permissible people or agencies to relinquish weapons to includes appropriate law enforcement agencies, that's local and state police, including sheriffs, to a commercial armory, which is a for-profit entity licensed to possess and se secure firearms of third persons. People who are ordered to relinquish may also relinquish to their own attorney, um, but they must acknowledge that the third party is not a family member or household member. Under the Protection from Abuse Act, the judges can sign 
pursuant to a temporary order, a temporary weapon relinquishment, which is called attachment A. The judge has the discretion to order this and order the defendant to relinquish all of their firearms and prohibit the defendant from acquiring or possessing any firearm for the duration of the temporary order. That was already in the law. What the update is pursuant to Act 79 is that the law changed related to final orders. Final orders after a hearing, which includes a hearing where the defendant isn't present, which would be a default hearing, um, those orders must order that the defendant is subject to firearm and weapon prohibition and that they must relinquish their guns um, pursuant to that order. Final orders by agreement where both parties are present and the defendant agrees to the protection order the, that may be part of the relief, but it's not something that has to be ordered. Whereas under a final order after a hearing where there's a trial and a, the judge issues a final order that must be um, issued the, re, the firearm relinquishment. Um, states that restrict access to guns by abusers subject to domestic violence restraining orders have seen a 13% reduction in firearm intimate partner homicides. Um, so there is a potential for a wide impact of Act 79. So these are the 2017 numbers for Pennsylvania and the number of final PFAs. So in Pennsylvania across the state, there were 6,383 final orders after a hearing. So those are the cases where the defendant must relinquish the weapons and that the judge has no discretion, the, those weapons would be ordered to be relinquished. There were 7,168 final orders by agreement. So that's where the judge could issue that. It could be part of the agreement, but it, it is not a must. Um, still, you can see just by the those numbers, that's a significant amount of cases and a significant amount that could be of people who could be impacted by that. The other piece that Act 79 addressed and changed was in regards to the Pennsylvania Crimes Code. And if a defendant is convicted of a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence, which is a term that's defined by federal law, a defendant must relinquish their firearm to a law enforcement agency or licensed dealer within 24 hours of conviction. Now, previously, and this is a significant change, defendants had to turn over their firearms within a reasonable period of time that wasn't to exceed 60 days. So we went from 60 days to within 24 hours. The other thing that the law did was provide a procedure for how to relinquish firearms and what to, the courts should be doing after a defendant is convicted of a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence. Previously, that wasn't addressed in the law and the practical effect was that it operated on essentially the honor system of if you had this conviction, maybe someone told you you were supposed to relinquish a weapon or that you couldn't possess a weapon um, and maybe you did it and maybe you didn't. Um, so this is a pretty significant change that we've seen under under the law. Right now I'm gonna turn it over to Rona Gerber from Ceasefire and she's gonna talk about um, Act 79 implementation and some gaps. Thank you, Eileen. I just want to say this law would not have happened without combined um, efforts of organizations like Eileen's and CSIR PA and legislators and the community. It was the personal stories combined with statistics and facts that had a great impact when talking to legislators. And X79 took a couple of years of advocacy efforts from those groups, and our next steps would be to work to increase the the percentages of collections of firearms. So in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania, the police must post and notify all law enforcement of relinquishment orders on a computer system, PFAD, 
or PFAD. The responsibility is on county law enforcement to implement the confiscation. So this comes down to a municipality level, and that means that on a county, it could either be a county level or a township level, depending on whether you have a police department or a sheriff's department. And there's nothing in Act 79 that prevents an abuser from subverting a background check for long guns in a private sale. So if you you not know, in Pennsylvania, a long gun, which is anything can be from a rifle to a AR-15, can be sold from a private individual. That means someone who does not have a license to sell guns or a family member or a friend in a in a pub in a private setting, which means you know, any exchange of gun can be sold without a background check and without any record of that gun sale. The, um, Pennsylvania is not alone in the gaps. There are 16, don't think about this, 16 other states, which means 16, only 16 other states out of 50, which have laws similar to Act 79 with, that require the subjects of protection of orders of abuse to relinquish their firearms. And those states are Alabama, California, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Iowa, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Texas. So while other states may have may require may not require relinquishments, they do make it optional or make it required in some circumstances. So it's interesting to note that the, the firearm relinquished by counties in the state. If you notice in the lower part in the five county area, um, there's been a much higher incidence of folks that are relinquishing their firearms. And the same in the state. If you look at it, you can sort of divide Pennsylvania into what we call a T, which almost up through the center of the state and across the top, there's less of a less relinquishment. On the other hand, that's probably one of the highest areas of gun ownership that we have in the state. So we need to, that's why we're talking about this, to get more of this information out there and more um, awareness of this issue. So this, it's a snap. So that's why we're looking at the other counties and, and talking about it. So it is, what we need to know, is it a lack of knowledge? Um, or is it a lack of, I doubt it's a lack of domestic, violence in those areas. I believe that it's a lack of knowledge of the of, of Act 79. So we were talking about Philadelphia's low, if you talked, we reflecting back on the article from the Inquirer about our low weapons recovery rate. So the city is, while they, re they recover weapons only once every nine times a judge has ordered a defendant accused of domestic abuse to disarm, a record far wor worse than in surrounding counties. So we're looking into now and working with the organizations to find why are they not relinquishing the guns? And we're hearing part of the issues are that there's a storage issue. Like one of the things that folks hadn't talked about is once they recover these guns, where, where should they keep them? So we need to start working on with these municipalities about funding for budgets for storage lockers and what to do with them and how, you know, how do we implement them? So these are different and that will change from county to county um, and municipality to municipality. One of the other things that we have talked about is training, like just training in the sense of what the law is and making sure that not just the municipality knows it, like whether we need to do um, legal education for police officers, for the sheriffs, for the judges, so that they're aware of the issue. And that goes beyond the trainings that we're doing today with, with folks involved in the call. So that's the implementation portion of our of the event. Now I'd like to turn to Dr. Joanne Wood to discuss the child welfare domestic violence, and the role of clinicians. Thank you, Rona. As a pediatrician who focuses on the care of victims of child abuse and neglect, um, of domestic violence and child abuse, 
research studies have estimated that 60% um, of cases where domestic violence is identified, but also some cases Ultimately, 65% of adults that view also obese. And in addition to um, child abuse and neglect, their perpetrators of domestic violence may be more likely to use harsh parenting um, or try to undermine the survivor's relationships with their children. Domestic violence can also have um, impacts on parenting by survivors. Not in all cases, but some survivors of domestic violence report that the domestic violence lowered their confidence and their capacity to meet their child's needs. They may have suffered from poor mental health and low self-esteem that impacted the relationship by their child with their child. Um, some survivors of domestic violence also report that they used more authoritarian parenting techniques in an attempt to improve their child's behavior and compliance so that they wouldn't trigger the abuser. And so the abuser may also try to undermine the authority of the survivor's domestic violence. And so you can have both the direct impacts of abuse as well as problematic parenting that can impact mental health outcomes for children. There is a lot of children who are witnessing domestic violence it's estimated that one in 15 children are exposed to domestic violence each year. And we know from the research that children who have been exposed to domestic violence are more likely to have behavioral problems. For boys in particular, it increases the likelihood that they will grow up and abuse their own partners and children when they become adults. And uh, the exposure to domestic violence has been identified as an adverse childhood experience. There's multiple studies looking at domestic violence and other adverse childhood experiences that has demonstrated the lifelong impact that it can have on a wide range of outcomes from mental health to cancer, diabetes, education, uh, attainment, and even mortality. So just the mere exposure to domestic violence can have an impact on children's long-term well-being. Then what happens when we add in guns? So as you've heard that uh, firearms can be particularly deadly in domestic violence situations. Um, survivors of domestic violence are at much higher risk of death if there is a firearm in the home. There's a five-fold higher risk that a male batterer will kill his female intimate partner when he has access to a firearm. And intimate partners in the US are more likely to die from a firearm than all other means combined. Beyond the physical injuries that can be caused by firearms and domestic violence, they can also lead to increased coercion and fear. Um, they, survivors describe the harms of the mere presence. So even if there's not an injury, you can see some quotes here. I was afraid to go to sleep, that he's gonna kill you in your sleep. You're afraid to have any type of confrontation because you know where the gun is. Um, and women who have left abusive partners frequently um, report stalking and receiving gun threats. So even if there's not an injury, just the mere presence of a gun can increase fear and coercion. And these quotes mirror a study that was done here in Philadelphia, looking at the role of guns in domestic violence incidents. Um, and what they found was that in a third of gun-involved incidents, the gun wasn't actually physically present, um, but the gun was often used to threaten and so even if the gun wasn't there, and even if the um, partner who was being abused didn't have a physical injury, just the mere threat of the gun and the knowledge that there was a gun could cause increased fear and increased coercion. What about the impact of the presence of the firearm on young children? So we know that there's direct impacts from violence and injuries, but there's also a more emerging data to suggest the experience of exposure to guns and gun violence can have impact for children's mental health. So we know that indirect exposure to gun violence in the community setting causes significant distress for youth. And there's some research now showing that the presence of a gun in a home can impact well-being and mental health for, for children. And this in particular was a study looking at depression among adolescent females that found a link between the presence of a gun in a home and increased risk of depression. This is an area that we need to know more about. Firearms also pose a direct risk of injury to children. 
Gun violence is the second leading cause of death for children and adolescents behind motor vehicle accidents. Um, and there's a significant risk when we think about the fact that 4.6 million children in the US live in a household with at least one loaded unlocked gun. Um, and many parents will report that their children don't know where the gun is, um, but most children in gun owning homes actually report that they do know where the gun is, with more than a third of those children reporting that they've previously handled it. So what can we do as clinicians and pediatricians? Well, we should first of all ask about guns in the home. And one of the reasons is simply that parents often don't know about the risks. So as we've talked about, many parents wrongly believe that their kids don't know where the gun is, and they wrongly believe that their parent that their children haven't handled the gun. And some parents may believe that teaching their children how to handle a gun safely will help protect them, but these programs have rarely been shown to be effective. I think one of the hesitancies as providers that we have about talking with guns is we think that parents who own guns aren't going to be receptive. Um, but when there have been surveys of parents, including gun owners, most of them actually believe that pediatricians should ask about firearms. And they've, gun owners have reported being more open to advice about safe storage and advice and guidance on how to talk to their children about guns. Um, gun owners have reported being more likely to be offended or not take advice if the advice is that the gun should be just gotten rid of it all together. Um, but half of them said they would think about removing a gun if it came from a pediatrician. So I think as providers, sometimes we worry that families won't be receptive, but many families actually may be and may be seeking and expecting us to provide um, guidance on how they can safely store their guns and keep talk to children about them. And we can provide concrete advice for families. Um, so there are safe storage options and We've, there's been data to show that households where the firearm is locked and separately locked from the ammunition can decrease the risk of both unintentional or accidental injury, as well as lower the risk of self-inflicted firearm injury. So we can provide families with concrete guidance on how to safely store guns. Um, there's also been data showing that in cases where there's a mental health concern, if a family is counseled by an ED provider, about the need to restrict access to guns because of the risk of self-inflicted firearm injury, they are more likely to do it. So there's data showing not only can we provide useful advice, but families will listen sometimes. So what do we do in current clinical practice? Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics already strongly recommends that physicians screen for firearms and provide advice on safe storage. However, the majority of providers report that they don't discuss guns with families. I mean, this has to do with some of the things we talked about, that it's a politically charged issue, their fear of offending the parents, also just not knowing and feeling confident in how to talk to families about this issue, not knowing what safe storage practices are or how to discuss them with families. Um, there's also been some states that have attempted to pass restrictions on what physicians can ask about, so there's some hesitancy to dive into this topic. One of the things that uh, CHOP is currently doing is launching a new pilot study that's going to help provide education and safe storage options to families. So this is a pilot project that's being done in partnership with the Philadelphia Police Department that's launching in our emergency tar department. And it's going to provide education tips on, for families on how to keep kids safe from guns, how to talk to other adults about when storing a gun, and also even free cable locks to keep guns locked for those that do have a gun in the home. In addition to making sure that we are screening for and providing advice about gun safety, we also need to talk about incorporating IPV screening into practice. Um, one of the things that we can do is remain alert for clinical presentations or families in which we're concerned that there may be a sign of IPV, but also remember that most of the time there aren't going to be overt signs. Therefore, it's really important to incorporate repeated screening for IPV into our routine practice. Um, but as Teresa mentioned making sure that we're also respecting the, the beliefs and the what the survivor wants to do, making sure that we're screening in a confidential space, making sure we're not asking in front of a partner, and also making sure that we're not screening and discussing it in front of children. Our guideline here is not to discuss it in front of a child who's two or older. 
there are multiple different validated IPD self-assessment tools. Um, if you have a self-assessment tool that's available and validated, that's great. You can also do a verbal screener. There's multiple different ones that we use here at CHOP. Some are even just two questions long, so they can be pretty brief and can be incorporated into practice. Trace already touched a little bit about this, but if you are screening a family and you get a positive, um, first thing to do is evaluate safety planning needs and assess whether the survivor is interested in a referral to an IPV specialist or interested in referrals to other supports. For providers who practice here at CHOP, um, there are resources, including CHOP Social Work, our CHOP IPV specialist counselors, which are available Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, you can also provide resources and information on safety planning resources um, outside of the hospital system. So we put up the number for the domestic Philadelphia Domestic Violence Hotline, the National Domestic Violence Hotline. If you go to the Safe Place Resources um, page at CHOP, there is a long list of resources available. And if you're a CHOP provider, you can actually just type I, .ipv screen in EPIC and that resource list will come up for you. One other thing to think about is also thinking about the co-occurrence of domestic violence and child maltreatment. It's also to make sure that you are assessing any safety concerns, including child maltreatment. Um, and as medical providers, if there is an issue of child maltreatment, then we are mandated reporters of that. So how does Act 79 impact what we do? So the hope is that by limiting firearm access for perpetrators of IPV, Act 79 may help protect IPV survivors from homicide and also really help reduce fear and stress um, and some of that coercion that has come from the, just the knowledge of a presence of a gun. By adopting this stronger legislation, Pennsylvania may be able to help contribute to the evidence base on what policies are most effective in reducing harms to firearms in situations of domestic violence. Um, and obviously, as we've talked about, we've made steps in terms of this legislation, but it's also important to think about how it's implemented and how we can address some of those gaps that were identified earlier to make sure that it is effective. Next steps for us, I think one of the things is also conducting further study on the effects of non-fatal gun use and the presence in homes, particularly in regard to child outcomes. So some of the emerging data is suggesting that adolescent girls may be at increased risk for depression in the, if there's a gun in the home and better understanding what the risks are and how we can address them. As Act 79 continues to be implemented, we'll have to monitor for outcomes and ensure enforcement so that families are being protected as stated by the law. As clinicians, I think we need to continue to encourage ourselves and colleagues to ask about the presence of firearms in the home and make sure that we have access to and receive support and training in how to talk about these topics, both IPV and guns in the home. And think about who else is interacting with families, whether it's school nurses or providers in other settings that can help also identify um, and refer families for resources. And then making sure that we're able to be kept informed about when there are state laws so that if we do encounter a family in which there's concerns for IPV and there's a gun that we know about things like Act 79 and we know how to incorporate that into our counseling and how to best support them. Next, I would like to turn it back to Teresa to wrap up and go over some resources. Thank you. Thank you to Rona, Eileen, and Joanne for today's discussion on domestic violence and guns related to Pennsylvania's Act 79. Um, here on this slide is a list of resources that will be included in the email you'll receive immediately following the webinar when we conclude. Um, so these links will also be posted to the chop.edu slash violence website um, when this webinar is recorded and posted. Um, so I'll let you all sort of read through what they are here, but again, they will be emailed out to you and posted online. Um, <clears throat> the first that I find to be very helpful in terms of sort of provider slash professional facing as well as client facing is the PCADV Act 79 fact sheet. Um, it goes over the basics of what it is and um, I think is good at explaining it 
in accessible language. Um, a lot of times if you Google um, X79, stuff like this will show up, um, which is helpful. Um, but a lot of times you'll be finding links to actual law with um, legalese that's not the easiest to decipher, right? So um, it's great that we have this educational tool from the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, and they also have another PDF below um, on domestic violence firearms prohibitions. Um, so it, it sort of dives into, you know, the specifics of the firearms prohibitions. A lot of the information that Eileen so helpfully reviewed today. Um, you know, we also have CHOP specific resources, gun safety tips from CHOP experts. Um, I really recommend checking out IPVHealth.org. Um, which is an initiative um, for inter addressing intimate partner violence in health, health settings, um, ceasefirepa.org. Uh, I know there's a lot of information available on that site as well. Previous violence prevention uh, webinars um, include the two listed here from 2015 and 2017. If you wanna learn more um, specifically about the topics of counseling on gun safety in the home, and or intimate partner violence in pediatrics. Um, so I know we did a lot of talk about how these things intersect, but if you wanna dive into more information um, and some more skills on one or the other, um, I would definitely recommend checking out these webinars that have been posted as well. Um, so we'll be sent out. This second is a continued resource. Um, so there are many of the, the things that we cited um, information wise today throughout the presentation. Um, here are the, the sources for that. Okay, so at this time, we would like to invite participants to type in questions um, directed to any of the presenters using the chat box. Um, if you don't see the chat box in the bottom right of your screen, um, you can click on the chat bubble directly under the PowerPoint slides. So if you sort of hover your mouse or cursor towards the bottom of the screen um, of the slides, you'll see a blue chat bubble and you can click on that um, and continue um, just typing questions that you have. Okay. So we do have a few questions here. I'm gonna start with this first question. Um, if it says, I don't currently ask my clients about awareness of Act 79, should I and how? Um, how does this work with safety planning? And is there an assessment tool that already exists? Um, I definitely think, you know, as we kind of touched on in, earlier in safety planning in the presentation, you should definitely ask about awareness of Act 79. Um, and use that language, like name the law Act 79, um, because that really helps with recognition of it, but also explaining what it needs, um, what it means. Um, so, you know, instead of using just like a, a normal lethality assessment protocol or your standard um, risk assessments that you might be using, um, specifically listing like Act 79 does this um, survivor patient, client, whatever language, whoever you're working with, know about it and just asking explicitly. And, you know, even if they say, I'm not quite sure, or I think so, you know, having a way to explain it um, in a concise way and say, you know, oh, I bring this up, um, not to just test your knowledge on the law, but um, it is new. And I like to let people know about it because you have some um, different expectations for um, protection against, you know, the risk of, of being injured, threatened, or hurt by a firearm uh, by the person who's being abusive to you. Um, I've got another question. Does Act 70, oh, okay. Um, how can I advocate for use of Act 79 in my community? I think that um, raising awareness of this is very, very helpful. Um, and Basically, outside of raising awareness, but you know, kind of training different um, organizations and agencies on what it is and how they can use that information to advocate for more effective gun relinquishment in our communities. Um, so, yeah, basically, I think it starts with awareness, but also um, 
things like investigatory journalism and really kind of trying to get a sense um, and communicate about what's actually going on on the ground um, is a good start. We're at a point where, um, you know, this was enacted last, last year in the spring. Um, so while there is an anticipation for a learning curve of how to implement some of this, um, the expectation should be that when it goes into effect, it should go into effect. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, do you have any suggestions about engaging clients? Oh, let me scroll back up. I haven't seen that question. So this question is, do you have any suggestions about engaging clients when they may be reluctant to disclose IPV? Um, I would say engaging people to disclose um, without, you know, sort of feeling like you're you're forcing them to tell you something that they're that they're they're not wanting to tell you. Um, I would say that along the lines of what Joanne was saying, that implementing routine and universal screening in a healthcare setting or other settings, um, saying, you know, we ask all of our clients, all of our families, all of our participants, again, whatever language you use. Um, we ask about this because we know it's prevalent and we know that unfortunately violence is common in families and it's important to your health, safety, and well-being. Um, so someone doesn't necessarily feel targeted about, oh, well, you know, why are you asking me these questions? Um, you know, it's something that we ask everyone. Um, so I would encourage screening to be the first contact point. And if someone doesn't disclose from being screening, uh, from being screened once, you know, they can be screened or asked in, in the future. Um, having an eye out for red flags of someone who might be experiencing abuse is helpful. But again, kind of normalizing that conversation and making those screens routine has been really helpful. If someone feels like, if you feel like a client is on the verge of, you know, maybe telling you a little bit more about what's going on, but hasn't actually disclosed IPV, um, sort of coming from the other end of it and saying, you know, this is the reason why I ask. It's out of concern. Um, you know, if you're if you're concerned about their response to disclosing, let's talk about that. Like, if you do say this is happening to you in your life or you have a history of this, um, it's aimed at getting you support uh, and ongoing help, right? So maybe kind of setting some expectations about what their response to the disclosure is to make it less scary for that person or to kind of, um, you know, address the apprehension that might be happening. Um, we also got a question about documenting in the chart, and I think this is a great point to bring up when we're talking particularly about pediatric patients um, and remembering that um, both parents may have access to the child's chart and being careful about making sure that we're not documenting any information that the other parent could get a hold of. Um, and so we can document that a screening was done, but being careful not to disclose anything in the chart that another parent may have access to. There were a few questions related to the scope of Act 79 and does Act 79 apply to temporary protection from abuse orders. Um, the answer is, is that the law was already in effect that a judge has the discretion pursuant to a temporary protection from abuse order to issue a weapon relinquishment um, order through a mechanism called attachment A. It's an attachment to the temporary order. So that already exists. So that wasn't changed by Act 79. Um, the enhancements provided by Act 79 pertain to final protection from abuse orders. There was also a question about does the relinquishment rule cross state lines? Um, protection from abuse orders are a state order, but they are enforceable in other states. And so I'm not sure if the question is getting at the fact that if you had a protection from abuse order against you in Pennsylvania, could you go to New Jersey and buy a gun? The answer is no. Um, if the protection from abuse is an or is a final order that prohibits you from possessing a firearm, um, then you wouldn't be permitted to go to another state and try to purchase a firearm. In terms of whether or not the um, law is retroactive, it's not retroactive. It's effective as of April 10th, 2019. Um, 
And the other question was, what are the enforcement provisions for surrendering firearms? The, currently in Philadelphia, each um, locality is tasked with enforcing the firearms. And Rona mentioned that some of the problems with enforcing the relinquishment um, and ensuring that people are surrendering their firearms is an issue of storage for municipalities. Do they have the actual space to store these firearms? But also, um, who is the person and who is the entity tasked with doing that in Philadelphia? Right now, it's kind of the police and the sheriffs who are who are doing it. Um, everything's being done through the Protection from Abuse database. That information gets transmitted to the sheriffs who then are tasked with checking on the order to see whether or not the relinquishment has been completed. Um, failure to relinquish is a crime, and so someone could be subject to additional criminal consequences if they fail to relinquish their weapon. Oh, and does it apply to police officers? Um, it does apply to police officers. There's no specific carve out for um, police officers or other professionals who might have to carry a weapon as part of their um, profession. In terms of a time frame um, as to how long an abuser is prevented from possessing a gun, if the gun prohibition is pursuant to a protection from abuse order, then the prohibition lasts for the duration of the order. Um, so once the order is expired, then a person could potentially get back the weapons that they've relinquished um, and or obtain new weapons. If the prohibition is pursuant to being convicted of a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence, then that's a lifetime ban on firearm ownership and possession. And so I wonder, how can I get active with a local advocacy group as a clinician? Well, you should contact Ceasefire PA and we will help you. Um, we could come out and do a training. We can provide information on how to become an advocate um, through the links that will be sent out after the webinar. Just go on our site and send us an email and we would be more than happy to talk with you. Are there any more questions? Um, and this is Teresa again. Um, so speaking as the IPV, one of the IPV specialists here at CHOP, um, there is a lot of information and resources out there for CHOP specific staff and clinicians. So um, through the SAP IPV program, which is a hospital based program, we do provide direct support for any patient, family member, or staff member who is affected by intimate partner violence, right? So that could be directly like someone who's a survivor who's actually experiencing abuse currently, someone with the history of IPV, or someone who's affected by it in some other way indirectly, right? Like someone in your life is affected by it. Um, so all those services are free and confidential. Um, and it really kind of um, spans the gamut of like, you know, not having to just have a conversation about guns in the home or have a discussion about intimate partner violence that's happening in someone's life um, in a clinical setting and saying, thank you for telling me, um, here's a hotline number, right? But having that actual warm handoff and connection to ongoing resources in the community. Um, one thing that we're discussing, um, especially with Act 79 and the, the differences and uh, of how it, we see it sort of rolling out and how the rates of gun relinquishment really widely vary in the communities um, that, you know, a lot of our patients and families live in um, is talking about 
you know, exactly what's happening where you live. Um, a lot of clients are discussing different options about protection from abuse orders, about relocating for safety reasons. Um, so really understanding, you know, will the law affect you differently depending on where you live, depending on, you know, where you seek services. Um, but really it is meant to protect survivors from that threat, from that harm. Um, what we also see on the other side is survivors who are thinking about, you know, keeping um, a gun or another weapon around for protection from their abusive partner. Um, so also understanding how the Protection from Abuse Act and Act 79 sort of plays the other way um, in terms of, you know, if you are not the defendant in a PFA case, um, you know, and you are the survivor, what are ways that you can safely have those weapons if that's a choice that you're making? Um, and, you know, the reality is uh, for abusive partners who are using um, various systems to, um, you know, coerce or threaten or abuse their partner, um, understanding that this is also a tool that some people who are being abusive um, might utilize it against their partner, right? So if someone's abusive partner files a PFA against them um, before they get a chance to file a PFA against their abusive partner, um, you know, how does that flip the script and how does that um, make it such that there is a lack of access to firearms and weapons um, on, the, on the survivor's end? Um, so that's definitely a consideration that it's, you know, this applies to anyone who is, um, you know, the the subject of a final protection order. But as Eileen mentioned, like this is something that has always been an option for survivors who are uh, filing for what's called ex parte or, or temporary orders. Um, so I think when you're doing safety planning and talking about the possibility of getting a PFA, understanding that all PFAs start as temporary PFAs, right? And when we're talking about um, permanent PFAs and orders, um, that's a maximum of three years, 36 months, with the opportunity to renew that PFA. Um, but, you know, in most cases, anecdotally, I know we looked at some of the numbers earlier, but most cases are going to be resolved with agreement. So an agreement between the parties um, versus by a final order. Um, so I think that there is a lot more space for um, safety planning and what the needs are. Um, but if it is by agreement, um, there needs to be usually some compromise between um, the two parties in, in that um, PFA hearing. Um, so, you know, they're going to consider the safety of the survivor and any, and any children that they might share with the abusive partner. Um, but it is, you know, considering both sides and having to agree um, to really end with um, an agreement. So in terms of uh, safety planning templates or tools, um, there's a question about like, is there a safety planning template or tool? Um, I would really encourage folks to visit IPV Health or Futures Without Violence. Um, another really awesome resource to check out is a website called loveisrespect.org. Um, it's oriented towards, um, you know, adolescents, teens, young adults, uh, really younger folks um, about, you know, like things that they can learn for themselves about healthy relationships. Um, it's also sort of oriented towards, um, I guess, teachers, parents, other involved adults in their lives um, about resources, about healthy relationships and teen dating abuse. Um, so they actually have safety planning templates or they're almost like worksheets. Um, so if that's something that interests you, definitely check it out. Or if you have questions about where to find them, um, I will have our, you know, contact information at the very end of this slide deck. Feel free to reach out to me if you want additional resources, um, besides the ones that we're offering, uh, relevant to this topic here in this webinar. But the safety planning templates, um, as I said, you know, relate to different domains of safety and different um, settings. So there's like, you know, for instance, it has a, a list of like, these are the ways that I can feel safe in school. Um, so if, if you're working with someone, especially more in depth or on an ongoing basis, um, 
there are definitely concrete tools to do what sometimes feels like a little bit of a nebulous process, right? Safety planning can feel like, okay, we're planning for safety, but like we kind of, you know, want to use a roadmap or we want to use a tool to kind of get the discussion going. So those definitely exist out there. Um, there's a question here. Advice for victims of how to handle a reaction from an abuser when the protection order is in place. Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the reasons that I've heard from clients about hesitancy to get a PFA is like, it won't do anything or um, the, the sense that like a PFA could actually escalate violence, um, which is very, very real, right? Um, just because there is a protection order in place doesn't mean that it has total domain over someone's choices and behaviors, right? Um, so I would say, you know, trusting the victim survivor, if they're telling you this is how this person's going to react or these are my fears of how they would react and therefore, you know, it's not worth it to get a PFA or if I got a PFA, it might escalate things or we need to kind of like do more safety planning and have more constant contact with an advocate or a counselor. That makes total sense. Um, I don't, I'm not sure about concrete advice, but I would say if you're working with a survivor who's afraid of the reaction from their abusive partner, um, to just listen to them and validate that feeling and say, you know, if you do get a PFA, um, you know, how, how do you know when they're, they're going to find out about it when they get served? Um, how do you know what their reaction is going to be? So there's a little advanced planning about, you know, can you be kind of physically far away from someone um, when they find out and get served by this, get served the PFA? Um, you know, there, there is the opportunity to have police um, assistance or accompaniment to serve PFAs. Um, that is also something that we hear about in Philadelphia that is an option for folks, but isn't always necessarily happening. So I think that's also a really great opportunity for advocacy um, to protect victims because, you know, if you're in a situation where you're feeling really threatened and someone's threatening to hurt or to kill you, um, do you really want to go to their house <laughs> to serve them a protection from abuse order um, without any support or without any protection? Um, in that moment. So, um, you know, I think that that would be kind of my perspective on if you're going to use this system, you know, asking for the support that you need and that, you know, we all should expect um, from police, from local law enforcement, um, because, you know, it, it's not meant to put people, a PFA is not meant to put people in a situation where they are more vulnerable or more at risk. Um, and like Eileen mentioned, if, if someone is convicted of um, a domestic violence misdemeanor, that is a lifetime ban, right? So there, there might be definitely a, emotional reactions to someone if they are a gun owner or are you know passionate about that in, in various ways. And they're being told, you can never have this ever again, right? Um, so specifically with that lifetime ban, like understanding what that means and what that might um, bring up and like trigger in terms of a response from an abusive partner is definitely a very important uh, consideration. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, there's a question of how to practically increase storage. And that's actually in a safe storage for police. And this is a great, um, opportunity again for advocacy on behalf of all of us, which is this is an issue that we need to make sure that um, you know, the sheriffs or the police all know to request. Like we need to make sure that our elected officials know that this needs to be a budgetary issue and that it needs to be included in increased expenses for these areas so that we know so that they know that it is um, a priority in order to keep our community safer. Uh, 
So this question was advice on how to start a conversation with an at-risk family about the presence of gun in a home. I think, you know, often I'm asking about very sensitive issues. And one of the things that we do that I think increases both on the provider comfort with having these conversation and also with the family is making it part of your routine practice um, and letting families know that your role in ensuring the safety and well-being of children, you routinely ask all families these questions um, so that it's not that you are looking at one family making a judgment and asking them certain families. And I think um, that can help that this is part of routine practice. This is what we do. And then I think also that then you become more comfortable with that approach as well. Yeah, thanks, Joanne. Um, yeah, and this is this is something that I reiterate a lot in terms of um, screening protocol. Um, if folks are interested in what the CHOP specific IPV screening and response and also like employee employee policies are, um, that is all available on the CHOP intranet. Also, a lot of it has been outlined in the previous VPI webinar that I mentioned and referenced earlier. Um, but essentially some examples about how to standardize it into practice. Um, anyone can verbally screen for intimate partner violence or guns in the home. Um, I think sometimes doing verbal screens can be uncomfortable because of various elements and things that we brought up earlier. Um, but things that are uh, tools that allow us to administer nonverbal screens, for instance, um, have been very helpful in sort of eliminating some of that discomfort. Um, so the prime examples in um, this hospital system is we do have um, like a proprietary tool that's a nonverbal screening card, right? So this card is found in our emergency department. Um, it's now found in uh, CHOP Carabots Pediatric Care Center, um, which is a primary care clinic that sees you know about 30,000 patients, right? So uh, high volume settings. Um, there's not a lot of time in, in these visits, but for it to be uh, prioritized and for it to be standardized, really coming up with an efficient screen that works with the workflow of your specific setting is really important um, and following through with it, right? So the mechanism that we've come up with from an interprofessional group of people who are dedicated to addressing IPV here at CHOP um, we've come up with this this nonverbal screening card. This card has actually been um, it's translated. It's um, you know in 14 different languages, um, which is really exciting. Um, it's laminated, so infection control is less of a concern. Um, it's written at a fifth to sixth grade reading level, which is the the you know the average reading level or literacy level for you know the area that we're located in here in Philadelphia. Um, so all these concerns, um, you know, and it's not going to be a one size fits all. It's not going to be, um, you know, a screen that can happen to everyone or every time. Um, but we are tracking when screens are happening um, in the ED and in well visits and when they're not happening, documenting that they didn't happen and also why, right? Because there are a lot of situations where it's not safe to screen someone for intimate partner violence. Uh, Joanne mentioned a few examples earlier. Um, multiple caregivers are present. You know, you need you need to ask in a in a private and confidential way. Um, you know, maybe there is some medical acuity. So in the emergency department, like it's not necessarily appropriate to talk about um, guns in the home or intimate partner violence when there's you know an acute injury or infection or something like that happening. Um, so, you know, there are reasons to defer that screen or not to screen, but um, for all the instances where it is possible and it is safe, um, really making sure that you do it um, in a compassionate and a sensitive way as well, because again, it is more about the response after the screen than the screen itself, right? Um, we can look at screening rates and talk about, you know, the metrics of like, oh, aren't we doing a great job? We're asking everyone. But if you're not asking in the right way, um, you know, you're not going to get people who feel comfortable disclosing and you're not going to make that resource connection. Um, so, you know, like I said before, when someone asked a question about, you know, if someone's sort of 
if you if you get the sense that someone's wanting to talk more or disclose but isn't, you know, how to kind of um, bridge that gap. I think it's just about building a rapport and building trust. Um, and there are probably a lot of really unique opportunities for that, depending on what setting you're working in. Um, but I do think that talking about what's on the other side of it, you know, we want to know because it's important, um, but mostly that, you know, people deserve to feel safe and be safe. Um, and there is some intervention that can happen, you know, today in the here and now in this clinic visit um, with you. So, you know, it, not everyone's going to be in the same place with it. Um, and one thing that I always like to remind people is that intimate partner violence is a pattern and there is this cycle of abuse. So even if you're in a clinic setting where there's continuity of care, you're, um, that person that you talk to who disclosed IPV or disclosed, um, you know, an issue with gun violence or risk in the home, um, they're going to be at different points with it um, in, in the future. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're still living it day in, day out. And it's just our job to assess the situation and try to provide as many tools as possible for people to stay as safe as possible. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if there aren't any other questions, I don't think I see any in the chat box here. Um, so we will go ahead and conclude the web. Um, so thank you from all of us. This concludes today's webinar and we ask that all attendees please complete the online survey that will pop up when we end. Um, as a reminder, if you're a social worker or a nurse and would like to claim continuing education credits for the webinar, you are required to complete that survey. Um, if you are a CHOP employee requesting nursing continuing education credits, you will need to complete the evaluation in my career to receive your certificate. So there's two different surveys, the one that pops up after this, the webinar concludes and the one in my career. As previously mentioned, the resources given at the end of today's presentation will be provided in an email to participants um, and you'll receive that at the conclusion of the webinar. This has been a, a terrific and engaged group of participants and we really appreciate all the work that you do to protect and enrich the lives of children. Um, so thank you for your questions and participation. We hope that this webinar was useful and actionable for you. Um, I also want to once again thank our presenters, Rona, Eileen, and Joanne. Uh, please remember to take the time to complete the survey. Um, at this point, we are going to end. <laughs>